Okay, welcome. This is OSARC's uh, 16th meetup. Today we'll be hearing from Lindsay Kay. He's a software engineer that's been working on um, browser-based 3D solutions for all sorts of visualization. Uh, he's been working quite a lot on browser-based 3D viewers uh, with projects like BioDigital Human, BIM Surfer, BIM Data, uh, BIM Data, and a few other projects. Uh, he's from the beautiful country of New Zealand, but lives in Germany now. Um, and Lindsay will be presenting the ZeoKits SDK, which is an open source WebGL powered JavaScript library, uh, just a few years old, which is very useful for uh, showing browser based 3D models. So that is it. I will hand it over to you, Lindsay. Okay, and I uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, to look. Yep. Okay, how does that look? Can you see that okay? Looks good. Great. Okay, I've made too many slides. Um, some of them are a little little deep into the programming. I'm just going to I'm just going to skim over those really and the you can see the URL there to the the um, slides uh, which I think I got it wrong, but um, here goes. So Viewing BIM in the browser is quite tricky because browsers are fairly constrained environments to do 3D graphics. They've got memory limitations and so forth. And, and so you have to kind of adapt your 3D algorithms a little bit to make them work efficiently. And some of the problems that we hit viewing big models in the browser is, uh, of course, loading them quickly over the web and fitting them in browser memory. And, and then, of course, drawing them interactively. And one gotcha that we hit is um, a loss of precision rendering um, models that rely on double precision coordinates um, because GPUs um, normally only support uh, single precision arithmetic to I think around seven digital pla decimal places or something. And so you tend to get a lot of rounding um, showing those really big models unless you emulate um, precision, uh, double precision rendering. And also, the, of course, the last challenge is um, having controls over your own control over your own tools and data, being able to convert models on your own server, being able to host your own models in your own viewer. And so, th these are the things that ZeoKit attempts to um, deal with. Uh, so, ZeoKit is open source under the AGPL3. Um, I created it in 2019, uh, and I based it on lessons learned making WebGL apps um, since 2009. Um, so since then, I made a few open source frameworks and, and built applications on them. And each time, just learning something new each time I do it. And, and so just trying to get the, the engine that I, I feel good about using to build 3D viewers. Um, so our mission is to make it easy to make those 3D viewers, uh, to load the big models and, and view them, uh, and to have control over everything yourself in the spirit of open source. In 2020, uh, I partnered with Creox, um, who is handling the uh, business development side of, of ZeoKit. Uh, so yep, it's a JavaScript library, uh, extensible through plugins, and at its core, it's got a uh, a sort of standard 3D engine with a scene graph, um, which is built from the ground up for uh, building 3D um, model viewer apps. So this is a custom engine. Um, it, one of its sweet spots is that it can it can render models at full precision using a, a tiled coordinate system, relative coordinates. Uh, that's that's all transparent to the user. It just automatically puts things into RTC coordinates. And uh, we have uh, offline converters that run server-side to convert a bunch of file formats into ZeoKit's native binary format. We load a, a native binary format into ZeoKit uh, because that way we're able to compress models um, very small and we're able to have full control over them. Like we can um, organize the the coordinates into a tiled coordinate system and things like that. Uh, on the right here, you can just see a small JavaScript snippet that shows the general idea of how you use your kit in JavaScript. But I'll, I'll just move on. 
Um, yep, we load the big models fast using a compact native format um, where we quantize uh, geometry coordinates and norm and, and uh, organize things uh, coordinates into tiled uh, coordinate system. Um, this way, we're able to have a double precision model um, at the cost of single precision, because every coordinate is stored at as, as a, a single precision relative value to its tile. And, Uh, so, in this section, this is how we convert a source format into ZeoKit using open source command line tools. Uh, we start off with an IFC file exported from Revit or something, and we convert it using this pipeline of open source tools, starting with IFC convert to convert the geometry into a collider file, and then collider to GLTF to convert that into a GLTF file, and then ZeoKit's own converter tool to convert the GLTF into an XKT file. And as it does that, it partitions things up into tiles and compresses things and so forth. And at the same time, we've also got the ZeoKit metadata tool uh, contributed by BIMSpot and that extracts the structural IFC metadata uh, from the IFC file. And then our GLTF2XKT tool combines the metadata and the geometry into the XKT file. And I've got a link at the bottom here to, oops, what did that do? Got a link at the bottom to our tutorial Excuse me, I'll figure out how to. Uh, yep. Okay, so we're going to link at the bottom here to a tutorial with more information on that. Uh, so at the Linux uh, bash command line, this is what it looks like to convert an IFC file into ZeoKit um, into the XKT format. And. Yeah, more information in the tutorial link. And here is how you view that XKT file in ZeoKit. So ZeoKit is JavaScript, ES6 classes. Uh, you create yourself a viewer, uh, organize, arrange the camera, and we're adding a plugin here to load the XKT file, and then we just go ahead and load it. So the idea here is to make it very easy to get started with lots of sort of sensible, sensible defaults and training wheels. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and run this app if it lets me. Oh yeah, here we are. And there's loading our Skip and Dom Lan model, which uh, loaded in 0.9 seconds. So here's a look inside ZeoKit. So to minimize the memory footprint in the browser, we're storing all the geometry on the GPU. Uh, so none of the geometry arrays for, for large models anyway are stored in JavaScript memory. This means that when we do ray picking and things like that to measure models. Um, we do it using GPU-based techniques. And here's an example of a large model in action at BIM Data. To draw many objects quickly, uh, we're using two uh, rendering techniques um, for reused geometries, angled instance arrays, and for batched geometries, something a little more radical, where we're actually gluing together all the, all of the geometries that are not reused into the, into the same uh, vertex buffers, and that way we can just draw them all in one draw call. So these are actually fairly standard techniques, uh, but ZeoKit, um, when it was created, was pretty much the only one doing it. So, so we uh, were able to load bigger models than pretty much all the other WebGL viewers at the time. Now, here's a here's a look at that problem I was talking about earlier with uh, loss of precision rendering double precision models on WebGL and most GPUs in general. 
Uh, what we've got here is a model contributed by BIM data, which is um, at its original site placement, um, very far from the world coordinate origin. So what we get is very large numbers for those coordinates and, they, and the GPU uh, or WebGL is rounding them to the nearest available uh, single precision values, which causes this jittering. And this jittering is a problem for most WebGL based um, BIM viewers out there. I think uh, ZeoKit and CZMJS are the, the two that I know of that address this problem. And I'll just run this example to, to show a live example of jittering. There we go, shaking around like that. Uh, normally to get around this, we would center the model um, at the IFC convert um, conversion step that has an option there to center the model. The only problem with centering the models is we can no longer combine lots of different models um, with their own placements. So for ZeoKit, very important to have those models at their original placement so we can show them in context. And here's our solution. Using the relative to center tiled coordinates. Um, Let's see, navigating precisely in a large model where there is um, big changes in detail from exterior views to interior views um, was a real problem. We had the camera moving too quickly inside buildings or moving too slowly outside buildings. Um, really good solution for this was to continually raycast um, at the object that you're looking at and adjust the camera uh, movement speed according to the distance to that object. Quite simple, but it makes it really nice to move around inside big models. Uh, these are our users so far. Uh, well, these are the ones we know about. Um, there are people out there using it in stealth mode that we don't know about, but these are the ones we do. And one of our favorite users is Open Project. I've been working with Open Project since 2019. Really great people to work with. Um, we've built uh, a BIM edition of the Open Project project management software that integrates a, a ZeoKit BIM viewer. Um, and the ZeoKit BIM viewer is part of the ZeoKit project and it's funded by Open Project. And so I don't know, uh, maybe I will, oh, yeah, I'll play that. <laughs> it's only a minute long. <laughs> so I've got an exploratory on the left there, which is um, populated by the IFC metadata. Uh, maybe that music's not required. Hang on. We're not hearing any music, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, we obtain uh, a 2D plan view by just an orthographic view looking straight downwards. And we've got section plans. Um, you can have as many section plans as you like, um, arbitrarily positioned. And what I'm working on with this viewer right now is the ability to show the, the actual per object property sets. So we've got a few more features coming in this viewer. Okay. DStudio is a, another ZeoKit user I've been working with. Um, their apps are still in development. They are not able to show them yet. They've got several apps in development on ZeoKit and I've been helping them develop these apps and, and they've been sponsoring uh, quite a few core features in ZeoKit. Just things like um, the ambient shadows feature, um, lots of refinements to camera controls, things like that. So they've been very good, uh, very good allies for us as well. BIMSpot. BIMSpot have contributed two very useful tools to ZeoKit. Um, they've con create, uh, contributed uh, an IFC um, metadata extraction tool, it extracts the structural metadata out of the IFC files so that we can build our um, explorer trees and 
so forth. And also a boilerplate to get started quickly with React on ZeoKit. And so they have a system here which does uh, model checking, clash detection, and all these features you see here. BIM data. Uh, I originally uh, contracted with them back in 2017 and built a BIM viewer for them on ZeoGL. Um, now, ZeoGL is not particularly designed for BIM or, or for rendering really large models. So uh, when BIM data started throwing um, data sets at it with like 100,000 objects in them, um, ZeoKit pretty much couldn't handle it. So, so these guys were actually the impetus for me starting on, on ZeoKit because we realized that we needed, that I needed to write the renderer a much different way in order to render lots and lots of objects. And so in 2019, when ZeoKit was ready, um, BIM data migrated to ZeoKit. And they've been very supportive of ZeoKit, um, helping us plan features, design features, um, helping us with QA, and providing lots of data sets for demos and testing. Uh, plan radar. Plan radar is using ZeoKit. Uh, there are their features on the right there. Uh, they, they're using it on a tablet. Uh, for them, what's really important is to be able to take that tablet onto the work site and use it offline. I'm, I'm not sure how they're doing that. I'm not quite sure on the details of that. But yeah, just being able to use it on a tablet is really important. So working with Plan Radar, um, we had to refine the camera movements quite a lot to make it work well on tablets. So Singular, another user. Um, yep, so they have a, um, a model checking tool, which is, which is quite well quite well known. Uh, Congrid, again. Um, so with Singular and Congrid, uh, we have support, agreement, uh, support arrangements, and so we're just sort of helping them as we go, uh, make, making sure that uh, ZeoKit works properly for them. Uh, and there's a few researchers using ZeoKit. And this is what I, this is really um, uh, gives me warm fuzzies uh, because it, it's, it's very useful. Um, so this is Nandini's uh, honors senior thesis project uh, where she's generating this, this model automatically from a floor plan. And you can see the, yeah, you can see the project there on GitHub. And what's coming up for ZeoKit? Um, in the 2.0 release, uh, which I'm working on right now, probably gonna be out in maybe a month to six weeks. Um, we're gonna have point cloud support, CDJSON, um, more metadata extracted. So we'll be able to show the, um, all the object attributes in that viewer you just saw. Uh, localization, we're now working with a Japanese client who's gonna, and who has, is the first client to ask for actual localization. And so we're gonna make it work in different languages and character sets now. Um, I'm working on a, a new CLI tool, convert to XKT, which will convert a whole bunch of different formats into XKT, um, city JSON, IFC, um, uh, point clouds and so forth. And within this tool, we're gonna to use a few different methods for converting IFC. Um, we're gonna use IFC convert, um, a, a fast converter um, provided by Crayox, and a converter based on WebIFC. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to switch between those three IFC converter um, components. I'm, I'm playing around with WebIFC at the moment. It's, it's very exciting, it looks really good. And big thanks to our supporters. So, and that's me. That's done. I hope it didn't go too quick. Okay. I will stop sharing now. Great presentation, Lindsay. Nice. Uh, I hope it was understandable and <laughs> it wasn't too fast. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's great. Okay. Cool. So if we got some questions, I always prepare some, but let's see if someone can beat me to it this time. Hey, uh, I got a question, Lindsay. Um, you'd mentioned uh, web GPU for, for the 2.0. Is that in the 2.0 release or is that like after 2.0? No, the, the web, timing on that? 
on that? Not on the two point release. Uh, I'm still doing experiments and learning with GPU, so I can't really give a hard timeline on that. But um, it's very exciting. I definitely want to. I want to support with GPU. So I'm not sure. I'd say I'd say maybe a year away. Got it. Okay. Chime in, anyone who's got a question, I'll put your hand up. If you want to use the hand on. thing. Go ahead, Janice. Yeah, can you show a little bit again the, the slide about the optimization of a viewer? With uh, You said something about uh, all the objects that are in a single uh, buffer, something. Right. Can you maybe... Yep, uh, I'll just share, yeah. Um, explain a little bit more or something, yeah, provide some more information. Sure. There we go. Okay, so um, on WebGL, on WebGL uh, for reused objects, we used angle instant, angle instanced arrays. <clears throat> and what that basically does is for each um, for each geometry which we are reusing, um, we're effectively doing a single draw call that covers all of the uses of that geometry. Um, for objects that are not reused, um, rather than uh, issue a WebGL draw call for every single object, which is a very expensive operation. We glue the geometry for all the objects together into the same uh, Uber arrays, and then just draw all those arrays in one hit. Um, in order to individually show and hide the objects, one of the arrays contains flags. And within the vertex shader, um, as we process each of the vertices in the WebGL vertex shader, if the flag uh, indicates that that object is invisible, we just do it. Um, we we set the, the 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 outgoing vertex in the vertex shader to a value that lies behind the viewpoint, effectively clipping um, that vertex from the rest of the shader pipeline. So so we're doing visibility culling in the vertex shader using that that flags array. Um, and in order to change the color of an object, we, we also have a, a, a colors array and we just update the colors in that array. So this, the number two, let's say just one object essentially in the scene, while uh, for the angle instances, you have uh, as many objects as different types of, uh, or is this also one single object? Um, this one, the batch, uh, the diagram at the bottom there, that's three objects there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a memory, it's pretty expensive uh, memory wise because we're duplicating all that information per vertex. Um, but the rendering speed we get off it is pretty good. I mean, we can, we can load whole city GML models of you know, Leon or something and just cruise around them 50 frames a second or 60. Okay. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Okay. I'm wondering, um, like, there's a lot of, there's, there's perhaps too few uh, model authoring platforms out there, but there's quite a lot of uh, viewing, BIM viewing platforms based on IFC and based on uh, other, other geometries. I'm just wondering how, what, what do you think are the interesting parameters to compare them? Um, you mentioned how you're, you're working on expanding, um, getting data, uh, if I understand correctly, showing the data that's in the uh, IFC schema of the objects that, as you click on them. And I know that some, yeah, some systems are really good at that, but they're really slow. I know some of the systems I use at work are often painfully slow, which seems a bit odd to me. Um, so what sort of things do you think are, are useful to think about when we're comparing viewers? Ooh. What's useful to think about? Um, I, I Why are think some about... of them very slow? Is that because they're, they're prioritizing things differently or just because they're I... old dinosaurs that haven't bothered to update the way they do things? Or? 
Um, I, I, uh, talking about uh, WebGL-based viewers, um, the, the reason why they're often slow is because they're using engines that are very general purpose, designed for sort of maximum creative expression. Um, and so these engines are, are really general purpose and, and not particularly designed for, for rendering really large numbers of objects. Um, so, I mean, yeah, in order to, to make an engine that fits a really big model into the mem into memory, you've got to um, build it from the ground up, really, to be as efficient with that memory as possible. And you can't really do that if you're trying to make an engine that's uh, really good for artistic expression, really. So I think I think it's partly from from using general purpose engines. But uh, having said that, I know that 3JS has gotten a lot faster lately, so it's improving, but. Possibly that's part of it. Have you seen the work that's going on with um, IFC JS? Yes, I have. Yeah, I've. Um, I'm currently making a, a, an IFC converter for a Zeo kit based on on IFC JS. Um, I've actually got a prototype. I might drop it in the chat window if it's a good place to drop it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Because for a for a novice like me, I'm trying to work out what are the core differences between what he's doing uh, and what you're doing. That's kind of where I was going with that question. Well, what are the strengths and weaknesses of doing this in different ways? Right. Okay. Um, so Web IFC is a WASM based um, converter that that is able. It's a it's a library which you're able to use to access the contents of an IFC file, which you can use for loading an IFC file into a 3D viewer. Um, that works both server-side and in the browser. Um, there have been uh, lots of experiments on, on using it to actually parse IFC in the browser. Um, it's, I think it's, it's early days for that, but it's really worth doing because browsers are just going to get more powerful. Um, what I'm doing is using WebIFC on the server in Node.js to pre-convert files into XKT. Um, reason I'm doing that is so that the files are very small and they load very quickly um, because some of those, some of those big files, uh, models can take a long time to parse. Um, so IFCJS will eventually hit a wall, right? With, um, with model size. Uh, well, at the moment it would, but you know, I I don't want to I don't want to um, assume too much here. I mean, the browsers are getting more powerful. I mean, things are just going to get more more powerful, really. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. when when WebGL first came along, it was a real struggle to to get performance out of it, um, and now it's gotten a lot more powerful. So, you know, things will follow that arc probably. Yeah. Um, here, in this um, project here, I've just made a, a viewer on um, on ZeoKit, and with it, I've bundled a, uh, a Node.js script that converts um, uh, different file formats directly into XKT for loading into this viewer. And um, I'm using WebIFC in here to convert IFC into XKT. And, so XKT, yeah. that's your own file format, is it? The internal. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, what would be? A... Yeah, what should I demo? I, mean, uh, I thought what you were showing earlier with. Um, I, I don't think any of us in OSR, uh, Johannes, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we've spent a lot of time looking at Open Project apart from thinking that looks damn cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that any of us have got around to trying it out, uh, but it is. Uh, but yeah, we've had some good interactions with them as well, and it's a fantastic project if you can get the the planning and the visualization and the issue tracking all into all connected. So right, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I tell you what, I'll just go to the ZeoKit viewer here. Uh, it doesn't help. Hang on a sec. <laughs> uh, I 
I just wanted to give an example, uh, give a quick demo of an SKT file loading. Uh, let's see, I've got, uh, I've got a few well-known files here. we we'll go for the Revit sample project. Uh, maybe that one, yeah. So there we go. That's, that's the idea of XKT. The idea is to just yeah. be able to load a model in a couple of seconds. Yeah. And something as simple as what you were talking about, the way you're managing uh, how to navigate and zoom in and out. I mean, that's just a painful exercise with some software. Absolutely <laughs> hopeless. Oh, yes, it was a painful process for us too, trying to work that out, yeah. Um, but, it, but in the end, um, we came up with something that I think is a little bit similar to BIMSync. Um, so we've got that, we've got that sort of uh, proximity scaling rate of movement here. As you get as you get closer, you you move more slowly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, another uh, nice feature, which was um, designed by BIM Data, uh, they, they conceived by BIM Data, um, was this pivoting feature here, where what I've already got is this you know click and pivot on the point that you click on. But BIM Data added this, whereas if I just click an empty space. Um, it, it picks a nice uh, pivot point on a sphere around my eye position. Uh, mm -hmm. find yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a BIM data idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky finding a way of navigating that feels intuitive for, for people that are not used to it. Yeah. And when you get when you get people in Navisworks or something trying to navigate, it can be um, painful to do, but even more painful to watch. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, of course, one of the problems we get with um, with um, some BIM models is the the structure of the IFC is not always quite perfect enough to uh, to robustly build uh, these sorts of tree views. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, CSJ, do you want to put your question? Otherwise, I can do it. You just break in if you get your microphone working and want to ask yourself. So CSJ was just asking, um, what are some of the differences between IFC JS and the Com and Compass Zero Kit? I don't know the relationship between Compass and Zero Kit. Uh, we've talked a bit about IFC JS. Uh, do you want to talk about that, Lindsay? I, I really don't know enough about it to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But does Compass also Compass also uses Zero Kit? Does it? I don't know who Compass is. Uh, okay. Oh, you can go back and watch their presentation. Okay. I don't, um, I don't think so, Duncan. I don't think so. All right. Yeah, Compass is not very much sort of a, a viewer-focused project. CSJ, you'd uh, let us know if that was a bad version of your question. Um, another question I've written down here which is sort of not the technical and functional side of it. So c can you tell me more about how your commercial partners uh, see the project and their motivations for supporting um, a free software project, which which uh, any other company, of course, can go in and benefit from? Um, and, and you were talking about CreoX um, doing some of your business development managing some of the business development how does all of that fit together so that they get what they need they need uh the open source community gets something that they can contribute to and work with and and you get your bills paid right um the the experts on that one would be creox themselves um the the reason i i really partnered with creox was because as a software developer i was also trying to um, do the the sustainability and the uh, you know the support contracts and things like that by myself, which um which is really um, n not my core competence, right? So 
Um, so that's why I partner with Creox and the, they are the business heads. Um, I think they can answer that question a lot better than I can. But, but from my point of view, um, it just keeps it sustainable. <laughs> I mean, um, we, we get uh, companies that want to use ZeoKit and they, they require some coaching to, to use it and some help, um, particularly with debugging their models because you know, models are sometimes never perfect, you know, so they want to find out what's wrong with my models, how can I make them more efficient? So, so we work with them to, to find ways to uh, streamline their models to work better on the web with ZeoKit. Um, we, we help them um, with, uh, with bugs they might have in their apps. Um, and also we make sure that our features are, are, are lined up with what they promise their customers. Um, so yeah, it's about aligning our roadmap with, with what developers need. Um, and so, so we start out with an ATPL3 license, so it's, it's free for, for a commercial, commercial use and so forth. Um, but we offer different custom licenses that allow people, uh, companies, to uh, not have to um, publish all their source code as part of the copy lift uh, clause of the ATPL if they need to. Um, I think that's essentially it. But, but so yeah. what's your, your relationship with Creox? Like, are they some kind of legal consultant or do you actually work for them or do they oh, give you yeah. freelance which they've negotiated or how does that work? Right, we've got lots of, we've yeah. got lots of people who, who are involved in OSR who would love to be in the situation you're in where they can work on what they're passionate about and somebody else can do all the bureaucratic stuff and, and they can just get going and pay their bills. Yes, totally. Um, so, 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 uh, yeah, they are sales and, and CRM um, people. Yep. And they're also an engineering company of their own, uh, and they make um, engineering solvers. Sorry, Lindsay, and... CRM stands for quite a few different things. So which, oh, right. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, customer relationship management. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and they're also an engineering company that makes their own engineering software, and they have uh, like stress analysis tools and solvers and things like that um, with their own their own developers. Uh, and so, working with Creox, um, they have also made their own C++ based uh, IFC to uh, IFC to GLTF converter at all, which we can use within our um, IFC to XKT pipeline. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice fast tool. Uh, it's not open source, but it scales up really well. So, so they offer that product, that, that closed source product that works alongside ZeroKit. Um, Creox also have the resources to uh, put together um, to do custom development for users as well. So uh, when we had a, a user that needs um, something something special built for them, then Creox and I, uh, myself and Creox developers, um, are ready to sort of get together and work on things for people. So we've got you know, we've got that pool of developers at Creox. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, I had another question. What was it? Oh, yeah. So, like, what what is driving the development of this as a software project specifically? Because um, you're probably in a situation where, in theory, you could uh, abandon the free software branch and, and still get your bills paid. Um, and, and just work on some closed licensing agreements with people. What, what are the advantages for, for, for the commercial partners and for you, and, and what's the motivation there? Well, I, I think it's, the first thing is I, I do graphics programming because I love it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do something that I didn't enjoy. And um, doing it with an open source community is just a lot more fun because you, you actually get to see what people are working on. You know, we, we can contribute to each other's projects and we can, we can share code. Um, I just would not want an, anything other than that openness. Um, just, um, what, are the, what are the advantages? Could you ask the question again? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, like, that makes sense uh, for you then as, as a developer, yeah. as long as you're not yeah. planning to buy your, your, your first private jet plane. Um, right, right. right. Yeah, well, and and yeah. How, how do your commercial partners see it? Um, 
mm-hmm. or do they not? Act, or do most of them keep their keep their contribution contributions closed in a separate uh, system, mm-hmm. or do a lot of them uh, feed back into the open source part of the project? Right, I'd say about half of them feed back into the open source project in some way. Um, there are users who who we we never really hear from they 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 build their software and they keep it very secret and they don't contribute anything back uh, i can't really say much about about that but um but yeah we do have users who who contribute back to them in source yep um, yeah I, I don't know what's going on with users that that sort of fork the project and 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 then hold on to their private fork to me to me that's like a bit of a dead end i, I imagine that being a whole bunch of nightmares merging code down the track. I, I'm not sure what that what that's about. Um, it looks like it's a strange habit that's been building on um, on the way GitHub works. But, um, right. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and you've talked a little bit about the the future, which is one of my standard questions. So. If nobody has any any other questions, then we just look forward to seeing you in the in the chat, maybe, and you're active out there, so people can get in touch with you pretty easily. Yep, sure thing. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have anything they want to add? I see someone yeah. turned on the mic. Yeah, I see that uh, you're going to be sending. Are you going to be emailing a link around for the people that attended this for the recorded? Version? Oh, oh yes. Oh yeah, right. Oh, You'll sorry, certainly see it turning up on on our Twitter and LinkedIn and everything when we put the video up. Okay, perfect. I don't know if if you got a separate. Are you recording it separately, Lindsay? No. Okay. Well, I mean, you'll get the link as well, and if you want a copy of the original video, just talk to Uranus. Okay. Great. Well, I think we'll stop the stop the recording, and we can chat informally after that. So, thank you very much for being here. Nice work, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cool project. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it.